Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another uh, edition of Deccan Murders webinar series. And today our speaker is uh, Dr. R. Suresh Kumar. And to introduce our speaker, I would request our uh, B.C. Chaudhary sir to our dear B.C. Chaudhary sir to introduce him, please. So over to you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Rikan. I think you know. <clears throat> uh, how do I introduce Suresh? Suresh was. Uh, a former uh, master's uh, degree holder from the Wildlife Institute of India, as also a PhD from the Wildlife Institute of India on his work on the marine turtles. And he actually wears many caps, you know, starting from monkeys to pheasants to amur falcon to cranes. You know, you talk about many things, you know, they said that is Suras Kumar, you know, has been working on many things. Uh, he has been in the Wildlife Institute for almost 25 years now. And uh, his interest is primarily lesser known species on which, you know, many people don't work, you know, such lesser known species, you know, he was working with uh, turtles, you know, uh, on the Wildlife Institute of India, uh, tracking them uh, with uh, reels of uh, threads uh, being uh, put on top of their uh, carapace. And uh, uh, he has been studying the ecology, migration and movement studies of these lesser known species and uh, developing conservation programs for them. Uh, he started his research career with pheasants. Uh, and in the Eastern Himalaya, he actually discovered a mon new monal pheasant. He also conducted several bird surveys in Arunachal Pradesh. And uh, that helped in identifying several important bird areas. Uh, he also found out a new species of monkey in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, Makaka Munjala, from Western Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, from the from the eastern Himalaya and Arunachal Pradesh, he actually migrated to Orissa to work in a project of mine on the marine turtle, uh, on the migration patterns of the olive ridley turtles in the Orissa coast. Uh, particularly, you know, he was based in uh, Rusikulia Rukeri. And uh, after his uh, doctoral work, you know, he uh, gained uh, a lot of sea experience, and then uh, that took him to the 29th Indian Scientific. Uh, expedition to Antarctica, where he spent about five months. You know, he probably still have not got off his cold pit as yet. And uh, 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 that from the icy continents to marine mammals to birds, uh, he has been working on the uh, migratory cranes, flamingos in Gujarat, spot wheel pelicans in the southern Karnataka, barn swallows in the Himalayas, and amur falcon in the northeastern India. Uh, it was very difficult when I wanted him to talk uh, to the Deccan birders. What is he going to talk about? Because he has such a long range of things on which he has been working. But I said, no, people are more keen to hear about the Amur falcon. And uh, Amur falcons, you know, you have tracked them from uh, from Nagaland to uh, South Africa. So maybe, you know, you also went to South Africa on your voyage to Antarctica. So let, let you start talking about the Amur falcon. So he agreed. And uh, thanks, Suresh, for agreeing to give us uh, give a talk to our uh, Deccan birders. Maybe many of them, and after you talk, will uh, start migrating to Nagaland to see the Amur falcon. Let's see you know, how interesting you make it so that people will start going to Nagaland to see the Amur falcon. Over to Suresh. So, thank you so much. Uh, I would say I've been really, really been fortunate uh, having got many opportunities and. Uh, one of the biggest opportunities that I got was working with you for the sea turtle project in uh, Orissa in my interest in migration studies. So thank you so much and thanks to the Deccan birders for having in presentation. Thanks to all the viewers, so many of you here and uh, thanks for your time. And just before I start, I just, and uh, I'll just get back, sir, just one second. <laughs> Migrated. Uh, can we uh, can we have the videos off to increase the bandwidth, please? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I'm turning it off one by one. So. Uh, so I go ahead and start my presentation, I, I guess. <clears throat> yes, please. Okay. 
So, uh, I love telling stories and we have lots of stories to tell, you know, and, uh, and this particular work on the Amur Falcons has been uh, one exciting journey and uh, it uh, continues to keep me hooked to the Northeast and to these really fascinating birds. So I'm going to be sharing stories starting all the way back from 2013 and I'm going to give you snippets of what all has gone on. I'm going to give pieces of uh, information on uh, what we know about these birds and what's our understanding about these birds because that's, the, that's something like my forte. Any of the species that I'd like to take up for research, it's more about understanding the lives of uh, these animals or these birds. So uh, the Amur has been uh, one really, really satisfying uh, project. And uh, I know there are uh, quite a few of uh, you who are in the uh, audience uh, who have been part of my journey. A few of you have visited uh, the Northeast. So, uh, so over to the story. <clears throat> so I start with this, uh, with this image. This is from the Wikipedia. And uh, this is about, I mean, uh, I don't need to explain this. When you see images like this, it clearly means that there's a lot of birds cutting across the sky. And when you see them flying in such formation, you know that they are heading to a particular destination or what we would say uh, migration. So uh, this is one such image from uh, the Midlands of uh, America. This is somewhere sometime in the 1800s when uh, people used to witness this mass movement of these birds. And uh, naturally, uh, a lot of sportsmen there, sport hunting, as well as uh, a lot of hunting of these birds used to happen. So this particular bird was apparently so common. And at that point of time, nobody exactly knew uh, where these birds were heading. But they just knew that every year during a particular time of the year or during a season, a lot of these birds would fly across the sky. They would fly in such numbers that it would be completely dark uh, when they fly across or literally cover the sky. So such was the enormity of these numbers of these birds that people often thought or, you know, the general understanding or uh, the thing was that uh, no amount of shooting or hunting of these birds would, uh, you know, uh, it would in any way reduce the population or lead to any decline in the population. But that was not to be true. The image that I actually showed you was of the story of the passenger pigeon. Many of you know today that uh, this particular species has become extinct. So, Population estimates during the early 19th century ranged from 1 billion to 4 billion individuals. So naturally, there were a lot of these birds and they were making these, uh, you know, migrations across the uh, American continent from Eastern America, Northeastern America, New York and Boston and those areas and going down towards uh, Central America. So I'm not going to go too much into that, but I have a connection with the story that I'm going to tell you today. And uh, so it, I, as I told you that the general feeling was that no amount of exploitation could endanger a creature. That was the understanding. But from 4 billion individuals, it was reduced to just one single female in 1914. And that was at the Cincinnati Zoo at, uh, when it died at last. So. There were a lot of efforts at that point of time. Like many of you know, today there are quite a few recovery programs for bringing back species that we know are on the way to extinction. So similarly, way back in 2000, I mean, uh, way back in the 19th, early 19th century, there was a lot of efforts, a lot of search was made to look for a mate for the single female, but she died alone at the zoo. So the species became extinct. And, uh, but at the same time, this actually set off a major conservation movement. This was an eye opener for conservationists, for, uh, for people to look at what they're doing to the planet and what they're doing with these, uh, uh, with these species of these animals. So even such large uh, uh, species, which were in such numbers in high in abundance were, were uh, you know, brought to extinction. So, 
uh, why I wanted to highlight this was that uh, also that Yeah, I think I think there is a small technical uh, glitch, guys. Just give us a second. Just give me a second. Just contacting Dr. Suresh. Yeah, Dr. Suresh, she can't hear. Uh, just bear with us for uh, about two, three minutes, please. He is uh, coming in that conference. the government, the state government of Nagaland and the ministry to do something about this. So that's a different story, but uh, Rohan uh, from uh, Green Humor rightly pointed out in this cartoon, which clearly states that, and I'm going to read it. Okay, I'm a little confused. The Amurs are speaking. Are we supposed to be amongst the world's fastest hunters or the world's fastest hunted? So naturally, the scale at which the harvest was happening was definitely not something that was going to be sustainable. So these species, like the passenger pigeons, were on the way out. So that is what was the uh, scale of hunting. And where was all of this happening? Nagaland, and in this very picturesque, in a remote valley in, uh, in Nagaland, and in these forests adjoining the wire that you see, the, where the, these birds were roosting, and that is where this hunting was taking place. So basically, a lot of fishermen who used to fish here, one of them actually found a way to actually catch these birds using the same fishing net. So I'm not going to go into all of those details. Many of you are already well aware about it. But uh, while we got to understand about uh, this particular issue happening in Nagaland, it was also the time that uh, many of us actually woke up to understand the geography of Nagaland. So you know that, uh, you know, Nagaland is a, a highly sensitive state, critical disturbance, and of course the uh, remote uh, that uh, very, very few people actually ventured. So thanks to uh, bird watchers and uh, conservationists, Srinivasan and uh, his group who were, uh, going into some of these areas for the first time and they happened to, they chanced on this particular event and brought it to the uh, uh, knowledge of everybody and that set things off. So when I look at the Amurs today, okay, uh, look at their eyes, big eyes, like any other raptor, bird of prey, very deep eyes. When I look at them, there's some mystery. There's a lot of stories that these birds have to tell us. Uh, we need to understand them. So it was also like, you know, till then, nobody actually spoke about the Amurs. There were a lot of other words that everybody used to speak, or a lot of other raptors, our, the vultures and uh, many of the other species. But very few people, actually, even seasoned bird watchers, would rarely talk about this Amur falcon. So when I uh, started off with this work, it was also the same thought species. Why is it coming to... Nagalanda, why is it coming to Northeast India? Come to that story. So what we know about the Amurs is that this is the least, okay? Surely because of their population that is estimated to be close to 1 million individuals, and they have a wide distribution range, the breeding distribution range as distribution range. So the IUCN red list assessment 
clearly place the species under the least concern. So as a result, very little research has had been carried out on this bird. So our knowledge of the species was breeding ground, which is in the Amur region, and so the name Amur falcon, and uh, is in southern Africa. So they are moving from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, which means they're crossing the equator. So they are trans-equatorial migrants. And we also, that is also reported in the literature, is that they are trans and elliptical migrants, which means they go down in one particular direction and return back in another direction. Before the tracking, satellite tracking study, the stories that I'm going to share with you, before that, there was very new about their migration routes. Uh, uh, the activity that we undertook was also to understand that. So before we go into the Amors, let me give you a little bit more background. India rightfully falls under the Central Asian fly region. And we know that a lot of birds come in from the Northern Lat. winter in India. They spend three, many of the species coming from parts of India, while a lot of species do specialize in crossing the high Himalayan ranges. So we do have a fairly good understanding of the birds' movements from the west, but there has been very little focus on birds actually coming in from the east. Now, after all of all these years of working in the northeast, we do now sense that there is a good number of uh, species, good number of populations moving in from the east through. The so the Amur is one such species that comes into India and it is a passage migrant. That it does not, its final destination is not in India, but it has to pass through, uh, through India or it does pass through India. And the northeast is the one of the major stopover sites for this particular bird. So if you go back and look at literature, and there are reports by Salim Ali and a few others who do talk about the Amors coming and stop, stopping over during the autumn months, which is October, November, for about three to four weeks, and 50,000 plus birds roosting in some of these uh, mountainous tracts. And uh, there is also mention about uh, harvest. So this species has always been harvested. Uh, it's possible that we did not know about it or there was not much uh, information uh, coming out from these areas about uh, this large-scale hunting. But no doubt in 2012, something different had happened. And that was more at a commercial that was going on. So these birds come here, stop here to rest and then disappear, only to be seen again in October, November of the next year suggesting the elliptical migration. That is, go down in one particular direction and come back in the other direction. After the work, when we tried to collate all the sightings of the Amors across India, now if I look back, this is, if I look at the eBird, now I'm sure that's flooded with a lot of eBird, uh, Amor sightings across the landscape because a lot of people have become aware about so you see that uh, majority of the locations are along the western coast. Uh, Dr. Suresh, uh, we seem to have lost you again. Into the continent and then moving but down to the western guards and from there heading to Africa, which means that they are making an oceanic crossing. This is a terrestrial bird. Okay. And making this oceanic crossing is definitely a, a risk, at least from the way we perceive it. But these birds, we know that they're very smart. They have evolved to make, so it must be just a, just a flight for them. But even then, there must be certain environmental drivers, certain factors that must be governing as to when they should uh, start on these migrations. So we'll come to those stories, but definitely, Quite uh, interesting uh, the stories that was coming here. A few of the sightings that's coming from Gujarat, those sightings are primarily during the month of April and May. So, but the rest of the sightings all along the Western Guards and a few sightings coming from 
Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Sri Lanka. So if the birds were there in the Andamans, then they probably were crossing the Bay of Bengal too. So we still don't know all of that, but uh, it looks like these birds can do quite a lot of uh, things. So when this hunting was happening, uh, it was again a major challenge uh, for us simply because of the reason that we, were a, we are a signatory of the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species. So it is a responsibility of India to protect all migratory species and we couldn't just be a silent spectator to watch what was going on in Nagaland. There was a general feeling that nothing is possible. Everything and anything that moves in Nagaland is eaten up. So it's going to be very difficult to control these people from, from hunting or to stop this harvest per se. But then we had to do something. So that, is, uh, that was another major challenge. No doubt when uh, this issue was highlighted in 2012, the Nagaland State Forest Department, along with uh, NGOs and uh, individuals, uh, started taking up uh, conservation measures across the, uh, the, the particular village in question. The, the area in, in Nagaland where the large scale hunting was being reported. So this did create quite a bit of awareness. For the first time, the, even the forest officials were moving into these villages, talking to people, asking them to stop hunting and that these birds are very important and that they should not hunt them. And so it did gain the support of people uh, in, uh, and uh, they did make a promise that they would not kill these birds when they arrive again in 2013. So this is happening sometime in early 2013, sometime in January, February. That particular year in 2012, that hunting was taking place and whatever birds that did arrive all went off to Africa. So there is this particular, this is quite a historic picture for me because today when we talk about conservation movement in, in uh, Nagaland or for that matter, Northeast, one institution that has been majorly responsible was the church. Now, there are several. Quite interestingly, I like to highlight this particular gentleman here. His name is Hemant Kam, Land Forest Department. He's from the Indian Forest Service. Thankfully, uh, Maharashtrian, and he was posted there, a young person, and he had just finished his training at the Wildlife Institute on wildlife management, and very much enthusiastic in conservation. So he was posted there immediately to take care of this issue, to stop uh, the harvest of these birds. He was uh, partly working, I mean, he was majorly uh, working with the local communities, educating them about the importance of these birds and that they should not hunt them. So naturally, in the start, uh, from the department, and that was a lady officer who belonged to this community at that particular site, uh, they both were, uh, uh, you know, door to door and talking to people and uh, passing on this message of uh, conservation. But then in Nagaland, people are very busy. You know, they all leave very early in the morning to their fields and come back very late in the evening. So very often you're not able to meet with them. So then there was this idea that they chanced upon was that why not we meet everyone at the church? Because you know, Nagaland, uh, the majority of the people are of the Christian faith and visiting the church on the Sunday for the Sunday mass is they, they have to do it very religiously. So, and they did, uh, you know, at the church and before talking to the people at the pastor, it happened that the pastor was very enthusiastic and very much interested in conservation. So that's how the story actually so converted the pastor to speak more about con uh, conservation and about protection of these species. And after every prayer on a Sunday, they, the sermon following the, some uh, discussions on how they should protect biodiversity and how they should uh, you know, stop hunting uh, these uh, uh, birds in their village in the Amur Falcon. So it actually set a stage for initiating other activities. The grounds, ground was uh, formed, uh, was made for initiating uh, activities like the satellite tracking that I'm going to talk about. Now, there was a lot of documentaries that were shown to them. In all of these villages, people do watch Animal Planet and uh, National Geographic and whatnot, wildlife programs. 
but this was guided guided uh, training it's not just sit and watch a movie and go home it was basically telling them about these interesting snippets about these animals uh, made a made a difference so all of these things actually i would say uh, definitely prepared for what was going to happen in 2013 so in 2013 the amours did arrive you know which they always do and interestingly here there was zero hunting literally village in pangti will out to hunt these amours so this is uh, this is something unbelievable that happened so people the local people kept up their promise of not hunting birds and uh, in the coming uh, same national geographic reporters and a whole lot of other media covered the positive story safe passage for amur falcons through india uh, india naga tribe pledges to protect the falcons so how is this possible in 2012 particular village hunting birds in such mass numbers and in all of them to protecting these birds and believe me all of this is happening in nagaland where we generally think that you know everything and anything that moves is eaten so this is one example to say and this is also one of the i don't have question in saying this it's not that i've been part of this program and i'm saying this but uh, this is one of the biggest conservation success stories in the world so the the steps taken toward this were actually initiatives from the people themselves it later on added on to that and brought in information which uh, was very very important so today we know that uh, nagaland is the falcon capital of the world uh, now it's also manipur we we been carrying out uh, uh, research in uh, the manipur uh, adjoining areas in manipur too so we particular region is the falcon capital of the world if you look at the uh, speck here is a number falcon so it's just unbelievable number of birds and i have been able to or this image only captures a, a certain section 360 degree view you will have amurs coming in uh, around 4:30 for a short while they all descend into a small patch of forest and by very early in the morning they leave so this is a spectacle to watch and everyone who is interested who is listening to this presentation i would highly recommend you nagaland and uh, look at the spectacle this is just unbelievable so when i look at every year when i go back so i i routine i have been visiting nagaland like a annual pilgrimage uh, and look at these amurs uh, coming into roost and you you never you never satisfied with the view you just want to keep on seeing this every day so when i see this spectacle it goes back to these initial few talk to the talked about the passenger pigeons to me this is nothing but the reincarnation of the passenger pigeons the amurs are almost the same body size the similar things as that of the passenger pigeons so uh now coming to the story Uh, about what uh, i have been primarily been involved in which is basically tracking the long distance migration of the owls so prior to this work there had been some efforts to track the owls uh, there was a south african who has uh, tagged a few owls they did go across india and went past uh, but uh, there was not much information that was available but uh, so yes yeah, so naturally around the same time this part we had started and uh, uh there were several questions when we started this work why is it that in 2012 the amur falcons were hunted in such large numbers were they not hunted in the previous year was it not being reported there was hunting but it just went unreported that's a possibility but was it that in 2012 there were such large number of birds arriving in this village during my initial uh, days uh, you know in 2013 talking to the locals there they all seem to say that they all seem to say that uh, there's hardly any fish in the reservoir they are responsible for that they have been dynamite fishing and the fish populations all gone and in particular locality there are a population of elephants that have that are no longer migratory otherwise they used to move down to the assam plains and come up but i believe their corridors have all been 
uh, you know, lost and they're stuck in this area. And there's regular crop raiding by elephants, so they lose a lot of their uh, agricultural produce. So there's a lot of problems that these people were uh, narrating. And they said that just when we were, you know, wishing that God give us more food, and then all of a sudden these birds started to, you know, just drop down from the sky the way the people were telling me and so this was a god sent thing for us god answered our prayers and god sent thing for us so uh, this is something uh, you know that's for us to eat and that's how they started hunting these owls so those were stories from them but what got me really thinking was that why is it in 2012 there were that many amur falcons coming to this village so where were they prior to this which were they coming from some other locality so till then we did not know about the other roost sites. So, do the Amurs roost elsewhere in the state or in the region or elsewhere in India? So, do they roost in such large numbers in, in the Western Ghats and some remote parts of the Western Ghats or somewhere in, in Central India, in uh, Sapkudas or Vindhyas or any of these areas? So, why is that the hunting of falcons only reported during October and November? So, this does suggest that this may be because of the elliptical migration. Is it that on the way back, they're going via Pakistan and then straight off into uh, Kazakhstan and Mongolia and go back to their uh, breeding grounds? So we, didn't, we, we, we needed to understand this. Finally, all of this put together, what are the migration routes? Okay, so they come into the Northeast and how do they go? Do they necessarily go, take the oceanic route or do they go via Gujarat and then and make a safer route via the Arabian Peninsula and into some. So uh, naturally, we needed to track these birds to understand this. A project where the need for advanced technology was felt. Small birds, they're just weighing about 160 grams, 150 grams, the males, and about 170 to 80 grams are the females. So the females are larger in bodies the raptors. So given that the body size is really small, uh, you, you cannot just uh, put any, say, you know, you need to consider the weight. The weight uh, of the transporter was a major, major limiting factor. So to that, so this project's primary aim, aim was to support conservation efforts. It was basically to tell them from where these Amurs are coming. So very often when we go and talk to local people, we are telling them that they're coming from Siberia. Now, a person, a local hunter or a village part of Nagaland, for him, that he knows beyond a his particular village, that mountain ridge, how are you going to connect him with the story of they're coming from Siberia? Where is, where is South Africa? So, when we, when this particular project was being conceived, the idea was to connect them with the geography from where these birds were coming. And it was not just about going and tell. Of course, an outcome of that is to understand the migrations. So it, uh, supporting conservation efforts, identifies which is very important, and then the migration routes. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Tracking Amur's poster challenge because of their weight. So most transmitters at that point of time were weighing about 10 grams to and above. And thankfully in 2009, there was this particular company known as the Mac from the US who uh, you know, made uh, a five gram solar transmitter uh, for commercial, uh, you know, commercial user to become available. Now, this is a very, very smart technology. Now, the, in, a, in a transmitter, one of the most important unit is the battery. Of course, gadgetry stuff in it, but the battery. The battery is what the unit or the equipment. So the larger the battery size, the more longevity or the lifespan of that particular transmitter. Situation where we can't a large battery and a solar panel, uh, you know, uh, part of the equipment actually brought down the trans battery to be very, very, very small. So this is a very, very smart uh, uh, technology that's been 
and, uh, land, and the other thing that we know is that these birds are long distance uh, migratory species moving and across hemispheres. So conventional way of tracking them, you cannot just go following them with an antenna and looking for them. They need to be tracked by a satellite. There, there are dedicated satellites that we now know as Argos and there are many other companies who uh, the these transmitter, the signals being emitted from these uh, uh, transmitters and then that information is passed on to a subsequently passed on to tell where exactly is object or the bird at, at the time. So super uh, thanks to a lot of miniaturization that is happening in the circuitry and, and many other things that uh, more and more uh, of, uh, units are being developed. So this particular transmitter was, uh, you know, fixed to the back of the birds like a school bag or a backpack and with a special harness known as the Teflon harness, the material, it would not cause so much of a friction so, uh, for that. So when we did arrive in 2000, 2013 November, that was my first visit to Nagaland, and I was Amur falcon roosting for the first time. I was accompanied by Hungarian biologists and their stories with, uh, relating to their being, but I'll tell you that at some other point of time. So when we did arrive, we didn't expect that we would see uh, birds in such, really got us wondering was that, how are we going to catch these birds? Okay, there's lots of birds, you can catch them. But you do not want to put up a mist net and a catch a thousand birds. If that is going to be the case, you're going to kill all of them because the net would collapse and uh, you, you would just basically kill a lot of them. And you also need to understand that at this point of time, the sensitivities were running very, very high. There were quite a few people who were upset about this uh, and in hunting and uh, that uh, they're no longer able to, you know, uh, get food for themselves and things like that. And at this point, they're preaching about science. We're preaching conservation and talking to them about the importance of these birds. So since very, very high. And so we have to uh, do something, uh, you know, like take people into confidence. So my, though my colleagues who I clear, the officials from the department, did promise that's uh, nothing to work. Uh, go ahead. Just imagine a situation for conservation work, and you, you cannot have a situation where you have a group of people netting the same Amur falcon in flocks for, uh, for the pot or for commercial trade. So it was something that's simply not possible. But thankfully, that year, nothing of that happened. And we get, went ahead uh, with to net birds. Seeing the numbers, we were super confident. But we were also extra careful that we would place the nets at a place where there wouldn't be. Uh, that many birds coming into roost so we can safely catch a few birds and put the transmitters on them and let them go. So we put up these transmitters and at that point of time, I, like I mentioned to you earlier, it was my first uh, trip there. I did not know the, uh, the way these birds were roosting and uh, we, our understanding of the birds roosting here was very, very poor. So we put up these nets, the mist nets that we carried and it was a four day program. We, I had these international uh, biologists with me and my collaborators and uh, the return journey, everything was fixed. So the first three days, we just caught bats. And like I mentioned to you, given the sensitivities, we did not want to in involve any local hunter or anyone who knew how to catch these birds. So there were, though there were quite a few people very enthusiastic, wanting, offering to help us with this, but I said no, because I mean, it's, it's ethically not right. You're saying, you know, you, you can catch these birds, you use these hunters to catch these birds for science, but then tell them, no, 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 you can't catch them uh, for food. So they could just simply ask you, is our stomach more important or your science is more important? So the sensitivities were running very, very high. And I told my colleague from the department, no, we will handle this on our own, only to make a poor show. We just caught bats every day. Given that limit, the, the uh, short duration and the limited time that we had, we knew we were going to fail miserably. And that particular year, it was just that we had to do this tagging to take this information to the local people. Situation seemed to be perfect, just that we need to catch birds. So on the last day, or the day before, 
finally gave in and decided that at this rate, we're not going to catch any more birds. We involved those local people who were offering to help. And the next minute, the nets that we were putting at the base of the trees just shot up 25 feet up in the air. These guys knew exactly how the birds were going to fly into the roost and what was the height at which they were roosting. We did sense that they were roosting high up, but how are we going to take this net up? But uh, we had these people who had uh, you know, these amazing uh, tree climbing skills who just climb without any ropes or anything like that. And on that particular day, the nets were up there, three such nets. And for the first time, we caught 30 birds in that effort. And 30 birds was a fantastic number. And thankfully, no mortality, absolutely no mortality. And we could choose. Now, it is not that we could get anything, but we could, we are now choosers. So we chose three of the best birds from the 30. Them for the first time, you can see this net. It was simply possible only because the local people helped us to hoist these nets up uh, nearly 25, 30 feet up. So the first of the three birds, which is the most popular amongst our lot of birds, the first bird was Naga, the second was Pankti, and the third was uh, Voka. You know, names all happened ad hoc. It just happened there. We didn't know. We had not been prepared for it. So uh, rightfully, the first bird that we tagged and uh, named it Naga, uh, because the male, a masculine name. Then uh, the next bird was Voka. I and a colleague of mine, we tagged this bird and released it. The third bird, we named it Park Pankti. Sense that, you know, why? who's going to release Pankti? In fact, the first bird, Naga, was released by the chief wildlife warden of Nagaland at that point of time, Mr. Lokeshwar Rao, uh, who's from Andhra Pradesh and PCCF and half of uh, Nagaland uh, there. And he was also very much instrumental in this particular activity uh, to be initiated. So thanks to him. Uh, and so we handed, so rightfully we thought Naga should be released by him and he released the bird and Naga just flew away. And then I and uh, my colleague from CMS, uh, we both uh, wanted to release Voka, we released this. And uh, Pankti was getting prepared. So each of these transmitters getting it onto their back, it takes some time, it takes about an hour or so. So in that time, it, there's a thought that came in and I told my colleague uh, from the department saying that, Pankti should be rightfully released by the people of Pankti, at least for the promise that they kept. So immediately we went, uh, we arranged for some vehicles to go up to the village and bring whosoever were there from the village to come down to the site of capture and release and uh, offered to be handed over Pankti over to them. And the man in uh, the red uh, t-shirt here, he's the village headman. So we handed over the bird to him and uh, asked him to release. Just when he was about to release this bird, there's this person here. He was the pastor who was involved in the conservation awareness work right from the st uh, start at this village. Stop, we cannot release this bird without offering a prayer to the bird. So can you imagine at that point of time, uh, you know, I literally had goosebumps. Because all of these people, the local people here, had eaten amus. And here was a situation, the same people in just one year time were now praying for the welfare of this bird, wishing that she goes safely to wherever her destination is and come back to the village the next year. So this was uh, an, a, a, a moment, a lifetime memory for me, and it has really, really influenced a lot of people uh, from these stories. So soon after release, it was 7th of November when, uh, when the birds were released, uh, then the incredible story started to flow in. Naga was the first to depart from uh, the roost site in Pankti and started to fly a thousand kilometers straight down over the Sundarbans and then the Bay of Bengal, cutting in across in Northern Andhra Pradesh, the Vishakapatnam Ghats, and then heading down straight towards Mumbai, Northern Goa, and that particular region, and then fly across the Arabian Sea straight to Somalia. So clearly, our earlier understanding that a lot of birds coming into the Western Ghats, so they are making this oceanic crossing, going into Somalia. Now, what was incredible was the 5,600 kilometer flight was made nonstop. Five, hour, five days and 10 hours nonstop flight. 
as we know today, many of the that we have, 17 hours is the longest that they can fly. They need to land to be refueled. So here is a small bird weighing about 160 grams and making this incredible migration. So when this story was shared with the people of Pangti, you know, they could, they were just in awe of the creationist, what God has created, and that these birds are extremely unique. So straight away, the birds' position in their understanding of biodiversity really shot up. So again, this is trying to tell you that how this tracking information was actually changing their mindset. Now, there was this other very interesting thing that we did. Most often, when we as researchers go to our field sites and do research, we do a lot of tracking or you know, do our research, come back, we do have local people helping us, assisting with us with the work. We come back and you know, put together a report and publish it. Now, very often, we don't have the local people themselves tracking it. So when we initiated this study as a, to support conservation efforts, so why not actually train the people to track the birds, their own birds, themselves? Why is it that I need to call them and tell them? So thankfully in this village, in Pangti, uh, there was a, a lot of young kids and literacy rate is very high. And uh, they were already into WhatsApping and interneting and uh, all that that was in good village. And uh, all that we needed to do was them, was to, to show them that there is this particular website called satellitetracking.eu where we hosted all of these birds. This is under the European Union, whatever funds that uh, is provided for such kind of uh, research activity, this uh, needs to be hosted on this website for the public to know where their money is being spent. So I just requested my colleague that I cannot make a website, uh, you know, I would just like you to uh, you know, uh, basic three birds so that I can share this URL with the locals. So from then on, till today, as I speak now, the locals have been uh, tracking these birds themselves. So satellite tracking.eu can also be used by any of you listening to this presentation uh, to go out birds that are uh, currently active. So this made a big difference. So in fact, it became so much that uh, people got so involved in this that they could sense, you know, they could get an understanding of the ge geography. This is exactly what we were wanting to do. That is connect them to the geography across the world. No beyond the ridges of their own village. Where else are these birds going? So perfect example of community involvement and uh, the awareness about uh, bird migration or the Amur falcon migration. So it is to this extent that today, many of these people who are tracking birds who continue to keep in touch with me, uh, they call me up and ask me, hey, the Amur is coming. Are you coming to Nagaland this year or not? So that's the kind of involvement. So one of the, like every conservation story, there are challenges. And same here. What kind of compensation can be given to the people here? Now, people were initially talking about how Amur falcons were important part of their livelihood. It is a season of bounty. Harvesting them was important, you know, to sustain them. So now all of a sudden this ban, and there has to be some form of compensation. I'm not saying there has to be, but invariably it is looked up in that, in that way. So what do we do? Here was a situation where we cannot just uh, pay money to everyone in the village or, you know, compensate them monetarily. Or there was that kind of compensation. But thankfully, there were really enlightened individuals, amazing individuals with very strong leadership skills who could actually voice conservation far more than many of us can actually do. So all that many of these villages, I'm not making it very simplistic or I'm not romantic, but at least a majority of the people, a majoritarian view was that, that this is part of our landscape and that you know, we need to protect it. So it was more about biodiversity conservation, it was more about conservation of the Amurs and all that they wanted was a form of recognition. So we started getting them letters of appreciation from you know, international bodies like IUCN and the CMS and handing it to them to 
to actually you know appreciate them for the efforts or to the steps that they have taken to conserve in fact uh, in this particular uh, poster this was sent in by chinese bird watchers uh, a children's bird watching society uh, saying that uh, thank you nagaland thank you people of nagaland for protecting the amors uh, because of you we get to see the we continue to see the amors so this was another way of connecting communities from distant regions you know so it this is this is this is exactly what we need to be doing in order to get them more involved in the uh, conservation work uh, so every year nagaland is full of you know festivals so the amur falcons arrival uh, again uh, you know is like a, is celebrated like a big festival there's a cake uh, cutting ceremony that happens and thankfully naga and pangti kept coming back to nagaland 2014 15 and then 16 till date those people in pangti believe that it is because of their prayers that the birds kept coming back to the village so this is again an amazing connect of how their beliefs and uh, thankfully thanks to the transmitters that they performed really really well so what we have now known is that it is not just pangti this is the reservoir this is where the famous amur falcon roost site pangti is but we know that there are large similar roosts elsewhere so it is not just one population or a million or you know hundreds and thousands of amur falcons in, in one particular roost site but equally in uh, in similar numbers at this particular site in another remote area in nagaland known as yongimchen then there's a site here and then there's one here and then in tanki national park there's another site here and now we know that there are sites even in in manipur so it has actually scaled up our work to understand why is it that these birds are coming and roosting here nagaland state there is a lot more remoter parts of nagaland why is it that they are not roosting there why is it that they are not roosting in the myanmar site this is the myanmar is border and myanmar site so again lots of stories but i will not have much time to talk about it here in 2015 uh, the inspector general of director wildlife institute of india had come to nagaland uh, i kept requesting them sir saying that we need to take credit for this you need to take credit you had uh, you know there's an amazing program happening here and people are looking forward to your visit here so they did come here and go back and inspector general of forest reported to the union minister um, sri prakash javdekar about what he saw the next minute the minister decided that he wants to go to nagaland so i got a call from my director saying the minister is coming you stay back uh, uh, i mean um, the minister came and i had this opportunity to interact with him and he was totally in, in awe of what he was seeing he couldn't just believe his eyes he was just mesmerized by the sheer number of amur falcons and that uh, i want to tag a bird where is the transmitter so i told him sir all that i had we already done we don't have a project and uh, we need a project to do the tagging okay so i will give you the project you you go ahead and uh, when next year i will come and then we should do the tagging i said this is perfect and i told him at that point of time that this is the pangti is not the only roost site there are many other roost sites by 2015 people from all of the other roost sites had started voicing this that why is it that nobody is coming to our village and recognizing our efforts or why is it that you are not doing satellite tagging in our village and naming the bird after our village so the, they named the bird pangti and pangti became very famous and so every other village where these birds were roosting the locals were insisting that we should catch a bird in their village and tag them so it was a perfect opportunity for me to tell the minister that sir this is what uh, is something that uh, the people actually he liked the idea he said yes i'm sanctioning this project you have to take this up next year and i'm coming to nagaland to release the amur the minister's visit definitely scaled up the interest a lot of media coverage and in 2016 the next phase of the amur falcon conservation started off with five of these birds and as promised tagged from different parts of or different roost sites from uh, Uh, nagaland and then they were also respectively named as per what the local people desired so 
coming to the overall story. So we now know that uh, they moved between uh, the northern China and all the way down to South Africa, and they go down in a particular direction and return back uh, in, uh, in another direction. Uh, so it's an elliptical migration. On the way down south, they go down, take the route uh, via peninsular part of India, but on the no, return journey, they fly over the Gangetic Plain and return back to Nagaland. And what is also interesting here is that they breed at 45 degree north latitude, north of the equator, and winter 26 degrees south. So they are traveling incredible, they're covering incredible amount of uh, latitudes. So naturally you will wonder why. Why should these amours travel so far? Why can't they just stay in India just like any other bird? Nagaland does offer them good amount of food. That's another part of the story. We now know that they are there in Nagaland, not just because they are resting or they're just on, it's on passage. There's a, there's a path in the middle that they stop and then they move on. No, they are there for a very, very specific reason, which I will tell you later. So why can't they continue to stay there? Why should they go all the way down? Now, let me break that story here. So this bird never sees winter. When they travel down to Southern Africa, when they arrive here towards end of uh, December or in January, when they arrive here, the summer begins in the Southern Hemisphere. Winter up here, it is summer down here. So as soon as the winter starts setting in or autumn starts setting in, they start to depart from here, finish breeding and then go down all the way down to South Africa and spend the summer months there. And as soon as the winter starts to set in here, they again depart. So this is a super smart bird sensing summer or seeing summer all through their lifetime. Why summer? Summer means the day length is, when the day length is very long, the productivity is very, very high. It is also during this time, the growth phase, there's a high amount of precipitation, there's good amount of food. Primarily, uh, you know, it, it again varies as to where they are. In the steppe landscape of Manchuria or Eastern uh, steppe country in uh, uh, Northern China and Mongolia, Eastern Mongolia and the Amur region, they're primarily foraging on voles or rodents and supplemented by a lot of insects and maybe uh, a few other things. And our understanding of their diet from this region is poor. Then when they come down to the Northeast, Nagaland, we now know there's an independent study that has been going on. We now know that they feed, they gorge on termites. There's a lot of termite emergence that takes place during their stay here. So three to four months, I mean, three to four weeks that they spend here, they are fattening up just on termites. Perfect, uh, uh, you know, food, uh, fattening food item for them non-stop flight across into Somalia. And then when they go down into Africa, there is some amount of uh, information available on diet here. Again, they switch to an insectivorous diet, but they're opportunistic. They could even catch birds, they could catch lizards, and uh, but primarily small body prey, they're very small raptor. They are definitely playing a very important ecosystem service or uh, to the service to the farmers. They definitely keep a check on the insect pests so very, very, very important species. So harvesting them in such large numbers in Nagaland can actually impact the use. So very important. So moving on. Now, like I told you, this study did definitely give us ideas about where all they stop over. So Nagaland, the Northeast India, Nagaland and Manipur, major stopover site. And this is primarily during October, November, during their southbound migration. After this, the next major stop is in Somalia. So from here on, their behavior will change. They don't uh, make those non-stop flights, but gradual flights flying down straight into uh, South Africa, or Southern Africa and Botswana in the Kalahari uh, Desert and the amazing landscapes that they, that they travel through. So in fact, uh, I, most of Africa, through the eyes of the Amur, flying over the Kilimanjaro, the Serengeti, and many of the major uh, protected areas, the Savo East and Savo West National Park, and then all the way down to Kruger and 
uh, many of these fabulous protected areas that we get to see on Discovery Channel. So after spending three months here, January, February, March, uh, down in uh, Southern Africa, they moved back to Somalia. So Somalia is possibly the Falcon capital in Africa. So this is like a gateway. So moving in and moving out is here, is centered here. So southern parts of Somalia, where the equator is, there are some equatorial rainforests probably, which uh, supports a good amount of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, food probably that they stop over, tighten up and then make these uh, crossing. Now, what is interesting is that on the return migration, they are taking the northerly route flying along the Arabian uh, coastline and then cutting into Gujarat. So like those eBird reports earlier, then flying across into uh, uh, Northern India and then across to Nepal and then to Northeast. Now on one particular occasion when I was tracking Naga, Naga was returning back for the second time. He was almost heading in the direction of Deradun. Deradun is right here. So I couldn't believe my eyes as this bird flying over over here to, to see me. And this particular flight is happening during April, May. And here you uh, need to understand that this is happening during uh, March. I mean, sorry, during uh, November. And this is during April or towards late April and first week of May. So it didn't stop over, flew across to the Annapurna Mountains. And I was thinking that maybe it's going to cut across into the Tibetan Plateau, but no, it skirted along the Great Himalayan Range, flew back towards Northeast and into Nagaland. And what, are, what was very interesting is that on the return migration, they don't stop in Nagaland. They are all flying through Northeast. They're all flying through their roost sites, but don't make the stop. Into the Myanmar side and stop over in the Chindwin uh, River Valley, uh, very close to the capital city, Mandalay. They stop there for a few days and then, but their stopover on the return is also not for that long as we have seen on their southbound migration in Nagaland and then gradually move, move up. And on the return, they probably stop over at one site along the China-Vietnam border. There's again a remote mountainous tract, possibly uh, they're getting something to eat there, fatten up and move on. So there's a lot of still uh, stories, gap in the knowledge of what we understand. And arriving here in their breeding grounds, what we now know as Inner Mongolia, uh, in, this is part of China. And uh, it's similar landscape as Eastern Mongolia. They arrive here in June and spend the, uh, the you know, the three months. And the, the day length here is about 15 hours as compared to uh, what we generally see in India, about 10, hour, 10 hours to 10 hours on an average. And here it's about uh, 15 hours. So clearly indicating that longer day length, lot more food, perfect area to forage. Possibly the population still moving up uh, into uh, Russia where they would be foraging. And uh, so having said all this, actually the question is that why do they stop in Nagaland? And for that three, four weeks, uh, it is of course food, but there must be something else governing. So when you look up, uh, you know, a bigger picture of what's going on, it's all to do with the monsoon. So we are right now witnessing the Southwest monsoon. Andhra Pradesh or in Tamil Nadu listening to this presentation, you don't receive so much of the southwest monsoon because the western guards are all blocking it and all of these monsoonal clouds move up and head towards the northeast and then uh, they start to dissipate here or move along the axis of the Himalayas and start raining in the western part of northwestern part of India. So the monsoon does cover a major part but the peninsular part of India the rain shadow areas of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh and Telangana dry, and they receive their rainfall primarily during the north returning monsoon. So it's so beautiful, this monsoon, which actually builds up in the Antarctic Circle and moves up towards Africa, arriving in the Indian Ocean and then into the Arabian Sea, it builds up and then comes into India as the Southwest monsoon moves up to the Northeast and dissipates by September. But it builds back again and it transforms itself into the Northeast monsoon and then starts to return in this direction towards Sundarbans along coastal Orissa and Northern parts of Vishakhapatnam and then all the way down South and then goes towards the Arabian Sea. So when we started overlaying these tracks to understand what was going on, 
This is the data of Naga. For four years, we were tracking this bird, and all through these four years, amazing convergence in the migratory path. Clearly showed that this particular bird seemed to know this particular road. It, it, it appeared like it did not know, only knew this flyway or this expressway up in the sky that it would fly. Now, when we overlaid this with the winds, that was when we got the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that the northeast monsoon, the winds are all oriented in this direction and they head out into the Arabian Sea. And when these winds are moving into the Arabian Sea, it strengthens up or it builds up as the easterly winds and, uh, I mean, and enters into the African continent, the Great Horn of Africa where the Somalia is. So this rain, rain or these winds, the easterlies, actually bring the monsoon to Africa. It goes down all the way down to uh, uh, South Africa. So the Amors on their journey, southbound journey, they're following these monsoon winds and going into Africa. So they're following the rains. On the return migration, they are making this flight during mid-April or May. At that point of time, the southwest monsoon is still not arrived. So they're not waiting for the southwest monsoon to wait, then they will get delayed. So they need to reach there earlier. Now what we witnessed during these summer months here, or during the April months, is that hot winds that's blowing across the western part of India. This is primarily coming from Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. These are hot winds. And that's how we witness summer here in northern India. Birds are riding those winds. So when I say hot winds, it's not that they're going in hot winds. They're flying at a certain elevation where those winds are cool enough for them to fly. And time the winds are oriented only in this direction. And that's why they make this elliptical migration. So really super smart birds, they know when exactly to, to fly across and make these uh, non-stop flights, the Arabian Sea crossing, this three days journey, about 2,500 kilometers, day and night flight. So incredible and amazing. So just when we started looking at these tracks and we started sensing a pattern that they will go down this way and they will come back. One particular bird that is very, very dear to me, of course, all of the other are most, we, you, you become emotionally attached to them. But this one is something very, very special. This bird is known as Long Leng and named from that Yong Gimchen uh, roost site, uh, where this, which is one of the second major roosting sites of the Amors there. And this particular bird, on its return migration from Africa, from Somalia, it did something different. It flew towards Gujarat, but skirted the boundary, uh, I mean, the coastline of uh, Saurashtra and entered into India in Mumbai. Then it did something still incredible, that is, head, start heading towards southern India. It came down towards Bangalore and then to Kolar and then returned back via the Tirupati Hills fly back. So many of you sitting there from in Andhra Pradesh, you may be able to relate to this bird. And this is the data of the first year. But for the, she is now active for the fourth consecutive year. And all through these three years or four years now that we are tracking her, on her return migration, she would do the same thing, come down to Southern India. So for her, visiting Southern India or the Tirupati Hills is like going on a pilgrimage again to Southern India and then head back up to the, to the Northeast and then fall in line or you know, follow the same route as what others did, go back to Inner Mongolia and breathe. So incredible birds and our understanding of this is still poor, okay? And so there could be many other populations doing things differently. There could be birds cutting across the Bay of Bengal and doing that. Now, there's one more very interesting information that I have to share with you. Every time that Long Leng arrived to Peninsular India, or there was a cyclonic storm building up in the Bay of Bengal. And in 2019, there was the cyclonic storm, Fanny, that was moving up along. And she was late in arriving. And she was just crossing Mumbai, and the cyclone had already reached the Odisha. And she started flying the cyclone. I was like curious, what's going to happen? Hey, this is going into the cyclone. But she, she there and stopped at that particular location, uh, very close to the coast, waited for the cyclone to make the landfall, 
and then immediately fly the next day, catching on the tailwinds of a particular cyclone, carrying her away really, really fast into the northeast. So they are uh, they are amazed. Uh, you know, uh, possibly pressure, low pressure or high pressure at uh, far off places they're able to sense. So I am now in a position to say that when Long Leng arrives in southern India, I know that there is a cyclone building up. And true to that fact, at least across those three years, there was the cyclone that was moving up. And the last cyclone was last year. Cyclone. She did not wait for Cyclone Amphan. And you may know that Cyclone Amphan was being predicted for a long time. And she waited and waited and waited. She decided, I am not going to wait any longer. And she left, and the cyclone Amphan still did arrive. Okay, so, uh, incredible story. So, Long Leng Saga has been amazing. She has given uh, so much of data. You know, it's something like a dream to gather information on one particular individual for years together. And as, as I speak, she continues to be there in, the north, uh, in northern China in breeding in that particular area. And it's amazing to again see that they show high site fertility, the nesting site fertility. They seem to go back to that same tree where they will nest. And another incredible fact about these birds is that they don't make their own nest. They actually use the garden by magpies and uh, other corvids in that particular region. So, uh, there is a million number falcons that we see, so there must be an incredible number of all of these other host uh, species, the, the nests of which that these amours use. So, so it's incredible, more than 10,000 locations, and I'm really, really hopeful and I'm praying every day that she continues to give us data and come back one more time to the Northeast again this time. The people of Lang Leng are every Sunday that she does well when she comes back and keeps setting this record. So while all of these efforts was going on in Nagaland, there was a lot of media coverage that was spreading far and wide across the Northeast. Naturally, it spread to all of the other parts of Northeast, Mizoram, Manipur, Assam, and Meghalaya, and Tripura. And a lot of people started reporting that there's a lot of Amurs coming to our village. There's a roost site here. But we did hear about this particular area, Tamanglong district, where a lot of Amur falcons were roosting. And the same problem, a lot of them were being hunted out. So naturally, the, this project you know, evolved into the next initiative that's known as the Amur Falcon Conservation Initiative. It was started in 2018. And a satellite tracking birds from there, and that's what the people wanted of uh, tracking birds here. To, whether to understand their migration or not is one thing, but they wanted the bird named after. So we did name, we did catch two birds that year, and we did name the bird Manipur, and the next bird is coming Long from the roost side, the only roost side that was known to us. We did catch the birds there. Unfortunately, after two days, Manipur was shot down when she had moved to another roost site close by, which we did not know. And this uh, hunter actually took the bird and took it to the department and said, I had shot this bird and it so happened that it had something on it. And immediately the department staff uh, called up to say that I had still not left Manipur, I was still very much there. And uh, the next day the transmitter landed up with the minister uh, of forests for Manipur. And then we were there with him and it was a very, very disappointing thing that uh, you know such an initiative and it's a major, major setback. But believe me as I say this, this bird's death did not just go waste. The bird Manipur being shot down was no doubt a huge embarrassment for the forest department, for the people of Tamanglong, for the people of Manipur. How can you shoot down a bird named after your state? So there was a candlelight march. There was a lot of uh, animal activists who were voicing what was going on and all of this had to be stopped and things like that. And this did capture the media. I mean, the media did capture this and uh, uh, a lot of information went across. It would have been just like, you know, one more place they did the tagging and the bird went, it was named Manipur, it was named Tamanglong or something like that. And, and so it actually captured the attention of a lot more people. So I'm saying that this did not go waste. And now today you would not believe in the time of the Amor's arrival, for three months, all of the guns are withdrawn. 
at least in many of these villages. So you will, you do not see any longer that mass scale hunting taking place. And it's all the people coming forward to, you know, take pledge and uh, support the conservation initiative. So 2019, we went back again, this time with five more transmitters and uh, with a lot more conservation uh, awareness done. As promised, we went back to, we went back and caught birds and named them after different roost sites. Now we know there are many more roost sites. In fact, the capture and tagging of this bird was done in the roost site where the previous year Manipur was shot down. So when I interacted with the people, they said we did not know that there was something like this going on. We were just shooting birds like we do every year. It's incredible, it's amazing what we could achieve in this short span of time. And uh, again, like I told you earlier, one of the fantastic conservation success stories. So to close my presentation, I'm almost across my time. Uh, just again, a beautiful cartoon that had captured the story. Uh, I'm going to read out. Uh, this cartoon basically reads this, that you arrested this boy for hunting birds. So there's a cop basically telling this to the forest staff who had brought a hunter and uh, holding a bird in his hand saying that, please arrest him, he's hunted a bird. So the cop is telling him, well, you idiot, this bird is not Amur falcon, this is Tragopan, let the boy go. So the awareness about Amur falcon is so much that they have literally forgotten this, their own state bird, which is the Blythe Tragopan, okay? So uh, this is to be taken on a lighter note, but uh, the, the point is that how, you know, initiatives like this can actually change the mindsets of people and uh, so is the case and so today when you go back to any of these roost sites where you see these spectacle of Amur falcons roosting you also see the spectacle of the local people who once just ate these birds now standing and watching these birds in amazement so that's what we want we want to see this change we want to see this change in the mindset in the attitude of the people and you need to connect them emotionally okay and uh, so I, I would say that we are still in the process of achieving that, but no, uh, no doubt, you do see signs of that taking place. And this clearly is an indication that seeds of conservation has already been sown. It is just a question of time that uh, things will improve and uh, will change. So whenever I make this presentation, a lot of people still ask me, how could this happen? I mean, one year, I mean, Nagaland, yeah, of all places, Nagaland and Manipur, where people eat everything. How could this happen? One year, 100,000 to 150,000 birds killed, and next year, you're saying that it is zero hunting. So administrative orders banning hunting, no doubt, stop them from hunting in the initial years, saying that if you don't hunt, if you don't stop hunting, then we will freeze all the uh, village development funds. Media campaign. You know, here is again a situation where media brought it to the attention of every one of us, but the same media played a major role in stories of conservation. So that was again important. So when they started hearing that Pankti is returning, every other villagers felt that Are, we should also name our bird. So, uh, you know, media played a major role. Conservation awareness, incredible number of people on the ground, you know, effort in creating and with the support of the church, the pastors, the archbishop, and you know everybody involved with the church institution really, really made a big difference. Community ownership. The communities also decided that, hey, this is part of our you know, culture. We need to protect birds. We need to protect the biodiversity. They, they started owning it up. And then the conservation initiative, which is the satellite tracking part, which WI had initiated in the initial phase, and of course, all through these years, has actually brought in that information which is required. But all of said and done, but the end, at the end of the day, it is the pride. So we need to instill this pride in people in you know, feeling that, that we did this. This is because of us, this is our effort. These birds are, are ours. You know? So that I would say uh, really brought in this uh, change. One last story before I close, I'm sorry, like I told you earlier, we have lots of stories. But this is again a very, very interesting event that happened. In 2015, the year when the minister, our minister Prakash Javadekar Sab, when he was going to come to Nagaland, just before traveling around. And uh, one evening, I was with, uh, with my friends who had come, and they had a 10-year-old son accompanied who was very keen to see the Amurs. He was with me. We had gone down to the roost site to see these birds arriving into roost. 
and then the light was fading and we were starting on our return uh, moving up uh, on the on the on the slope and just then this kid who was watching looking around he suddenly said uncle just look at this there is a pigeon then i said how can there be a pigeon here so we just stopped and we saw this last uh, flock of amurs coming in hour in front of us picking up termites that were emerging on last meal for the day and mm, just leaving off one of my friends from mumbai nikhil nagle who was carrying a bazooka lens a big lens he was keen to take a picture of the amurs he was and uh, i put my glasses to i mean my binoculars to see what the pigeon like bird is couldn't believe my eyes an all white amur falcon so i just told this guy just shoot the bird just get a picture of this bird this is really, this is one in a million uh, amur falcons it's an all white it's a leucistic form it's an it's not an albino it's a leucistic form and uh, he shot the picture so thankfully when i went back up there and he had this picture i told the community leader and all the people in the village i told them you know something very very interesting something very unique we saw an all white amur falcon in your village and you know what the response was the response was you know because of our conservation efforts god has blessed us he sent us an angel and they wanted it they wanted to call it the snow white and this was covered in the media the next day and in every other village now people were looking for the local people and others were looking for this angel the snow white all white and the discussion was here that went to this uh, level that we are not doing enough in our village that's why snow white is not coming or the angel is not coming to our village so we need to do more for conservation so that was a again an incredible story and uh, you know a whole lot of people behind this stories who were there uh, to help with this work undoubtedly and many of them have become my uh, real close uh, friends and we all together look for the amors every every year so thank you very much for uh, patiently listening to me and uh, hope i was uh, clear enough in trying to tell you the story about these incredible birds and like i told you every time i look at the amors look into their still mysteries there is still so much to know about them uh, that keeps me going that keeps me excited and yes incredible stories thank you so much thank you so much uh, uh, dr suresh it was indeed a wonderful presentation for us i hear claps i hear claps actually yes it uh, 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 definitely deserves a standing ovation for the word works which have been done in that region uh, david yankel any any thoughts on that i am still trying to recover from the talk awesome <laughs> awesome but maybe let's get on to the questions uh, here so oh, yes. yes i please. would be getting on to the questions now so uh, first question is uh, from geetanjali rajaram to stop the people from hunting did the government or ngos offer them other opportunities for their livelihood uh, so so even wti gave meat for meat so do, do i go ahead and respond to that Yeah, yeah, please, please, you can. I, I'll be reading out the questions, so you can answer them one by one. Okay, so let me let me answer this question. Yes, uh, that's a very important question. Uh, it's about livelihoods, and uh, to be honest, we're still trying to figure a way out. Okay, there was an initial uh, uh, excitement about uh, starting off ecotourism and things like that, and uh, uh, the government of Nagaland did try and raise some money from. Uh, the uh, central government to start some tourism related no doubt tourism is is important it's required but uh, from our understanding of how the amurs are using this landscape all that i advise the government or the department is that please do not invest in hard infrastructure when we talk about tourism they get the money build some cottages in a particular uh, say for example pankti pankti is where the focus is still more because the road access is there a lot of people know about pankti more and so a lot of people travel to pankti but uh, not many people go to longlang or the other rural sites so a lot of investment was foreseen or was being planned for pankti so i had told them that uh, please don't do uh, invest in hard infrastructure 
simply because what we know now is that these continue to shift their own size. 2012, that particular year, or maybe the year earlier to that, a lot of these birds started arriving in in very large numbers simply because they had moved from a, from some other roost site over here. There are several in where people were protecting them way back in 2009, just seeing that sheer number which we never got to know. And those people are saying that we started protecting this place, but today the Amors are not coming to our village. They all have gone off to Pankti. So Amors are shifting their roost site. So looking at tourism as an alternative is going to be a challenge. Of course, it's important, but I have told them, I mean, or rather the research that we see that uh, investing in hard infrastructure is difficult. So what else do we do? It's a very, very difficult uh, question. I, we're still trying to figure out. There has to be some other way. And uh, there are situations. See, I have tried to tell you all the good stories. There are still challenges. There are still people in some of these villages who feel, who still feel that the government, what they have promised, they have not done. We are going to start hunting these birds. You know, I, I am now of this opinion that, uh, you know, even if they start hunting, that's my biggest fear. They have built such a good story. Now, if, even if there is going to be one incident where they go back and he'll kill 100,000 birds again, then all of these years of effort is going to go waste. But thankfully, they so much that the Naga people themselves, the villagers themselves would not want such a thing. So I am kind of assured that that kind of an episode will not take place. And as a result, uh, they are still trying to find how better they can improve their livelihood, trying to solve issues with the human elephant conflict that they're facing. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going around and telling you the story because there is still, there doesn't seem to be a straightforward answer. But let me also give you the other picture that at least in many of the other villages where I raised this point about, or highlighted this point about community ownership, these people are of the opinion that we don't need anything. This is part of our culture. These birds coming here is part of their, their uh, life cycle. So we are happy that they're coming to a village. We really don't need anything. They don't, they don't really care. Mm -hmm. Possibly would like the government to recognize that, yes, we are protecting these birds. You know? so, Yes, so there are different views. Uh, I think it's still a challenge uh, working towards that, working towards that. Okay. So uh, just to follow up to what you, just to follow up to what you said regarding uh, people relapsing uh, for going back to hunting these birds, right? What could oh. be a trigger point? What could be a potential trigger point? No. See, there, is, there are these other issues that, uh, that we also need to understand. Uh, very often we, we feel that the government is not doing much. Or now when it comes to wild species, protection of wild species, it is the mandate of the forest department that the department concerned with. Now here in Nagaland, it's a very, very different situation. Same in the, in the, in the northeastern parts of Tamang Long or in major parts of Manipur, where the land ownership is with the communities. Nearly 98% of the land or 95% of the land ownership is of the communities in Nagaland at least. And as a result, it is the communities who dictate what they will be doing. And so in some of these areas, some of these roost sites, the land where these birds roost, the land, entire land belongs to the community, belongs to the village. So there is a village council who take a call and you know they have a control over that what each individual in the village does. So in fact, in one of these villages, especially Yongim Chen, where they have imposed fines, anybody found hunting or shooting, he will be imprisoned and 20,000 rupees fine. And they continue to practice that even till today. Mm -hmm. But in, other, in, in the case of Pangti, the situation is different. The land where these birds are roosting, it belongs to the clan. So actually pa different parcels of land belong to different, different individuals. So some individuals are pro-conservation, some individuals don't care, or you know, they, they have not much to do. So again, trying to, uh, you know, the trigger point, the flash point, it, it can happen. So 
the thing is that the there is a sense of pride which has gone a little to the extreme also i would say some people have taken it so much that they are feeling that everything about amur falcon should be only but they still are not able to understand so what we are trying to educate people about is that the amurs do not belong to your village alone they belong to the entire landscape so as part of my work we are looking at something what is known as the amur arc the amur arc actually extends all along all the way from meghalaya into the patkai hills and into the chin hills in myanmar so this amur arc the birds could go roost anywhere they can there are potential roost sites elsewhere also so we are trying to educate people that you know if you resort to killing then the birds would so so uh, don't really know what the trigger point could be but uh, yes the trigger point is that the government is not doing much okay. the government needs to do more they want a road a uh, metal road leading to the village unfortunately things don't happen very well in nagaland and uh, the money is given to the communities only to build the road where they themselves uh, misuse those funds and the road never appears so uh, corruption is one of the biggest problems in this place okay so thank you so thank you for that answer uh, so the next question is by kamandi yella prakash rao and uh, he asks what was the attitude of their migration what is the attitude of altitude altitude of the migration altitude of the migration okay so this is something that we still don't know uh, these tags don't log uh, you know the uh, the heights at which they fly they just give you the location so we still don't know but uh, given their body size and from the wind patterns that they are probably Of course, it may be using. Uh, it appears that they're probably flying somewhere between a thousand meters to two thousand five hundred meters. So, so uh, sorry, so Mike went on mute, please. You you went on mute, sir. Mute. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now we can hear you. Now we can hear you. Okay. So what I'm basically saying is that. Uh, we don't know about the heights or the altitude at which these birds fly because these these tanks that we have deployed on them don't carry that altimeter okay and uh, from what we understand we we believe is that it's between 1000 to 2000 meters is what they are flying at the, the their flight height could be okay because it is that at that height uh, is where these winds uh, you know uh, heading towards africa either on the southbound migration that's how these winds are so if they are they are definitely using those winds so i told you earlier that they are flying 5600 kilometers 5 days 10 hours that amounts to 45 kilometers per hour so 45 kilometers per hour, per hour their effort kilometers per hour because their tailwind is about 25 kilometers per hour and this tailwind is a situation if you go higher up then the wind because at different heights there are different winds flowing in different directions so we still don't know the exact height at which they are flying true true okay um thank you sir and uh, commander sir i think uh, hope your question is answered uh next question is by vasant rajan uh the question is the monolith as it is at what place at pankti i didn't see in october 2015 Uh, sorry uh, shrikant i really cannot hear you well uh, the monolith is at what place at pankti i did not see in october 2015 uh, he did not see what uh, he did not see any amurs in october 2015 uh, it uh, when when was the time when he when he went there because their arrival into nagaland or northeast can be delayed by a week so it is generally from 20th of uh october onwards and uh, till 15th of november so if you go a few days earlier you may not see them okay so um uh, so wasn't rajan i think uh, you might just type in your because can i just button for a second yeah yeah sure mesh uh dr suresh you was referring to the monolith yes yes please 
you did no, not see the monolith he was referring to the monolith it was it was the monolith is it okay yes, sorry oh, yes. i didn't hear that very well okay so the monolith okay it was not there when you went there no no apparently not okay so there is there are some tension with the villagers okay they are not happy with the, the government and uh, they were trying to boycott uh, with the government uh, you know saying that you had promised a lot of things so uh, there is also this other challenge you know very often when we take up conservation work we try to promise a lot of things to people and uh, it is also to do with the higher officials coming in they do take notice so if you look at the number of visitors to pangti almost all of the high profile visitors have all come to pangti it's only a actually gone to the other villages so the high in that it has also worked against much of the effort so everyone who's gone has tried to has has tried in say that okay we will try take this up but somehow something or the other it has been caught up for example the elephant uh, issue wti is currently undertaking some program on trying to resolve the conflict but on the ground the situation is really really bad every year so for them you have promised so many things but you have not done so you know so as a result in i do know that one or two of those years when uh, uh, they have tried to block into their village uh, last year i mean the year before they didn't want any any bird watchers to visit the village they felt that what is the need of tourism okay and uh, there has also been some conflict amongst the villagers also so that you know there are communities who who feel that they have done most for conservation of amurs but they have not been acknowledged properly or the other community in the village has taken over these are small small rifts that is there so uh, this is happening in pangti so pangti does require a lot more hand holding and it is not is it's not easy so possibly the monolith uh, disappeared uh, because because of that uh, that issue but i'm sure it will be put back in its place because the i know that now the situation in pangti is better right oh, yeah. thank you thank you thank you sir and uh, actually just going through the questions uh, the next question is by uh, I'm sorry. Uh, just give me a moment. Yeah, by Mujib, and the question is, why they, why they cross the Western Ghat for straight flying, or why are they diverting from here? I'm expecting from Western Ghat. Uh, also, he heard that they didn't cross the Himalayas. Also, why? Okay, so uh, if you look at the, like I told you again, a very very smart bird. So. if you see the western coast of india mumbai south and maybe north of karwar and karnataka that particular belt is where most of the amurs are funneling in and heading into uh, the north into into somalia so you will need to visualize the the way the sea scapes or the the globe okay so this is actually the shortest distance if they want to cross the arabia and taking means if they are going to make a crossing say from tiruvananthapuram and the heading out towards the mal maybe going all the way down to mauritius and then going into uh, across into south africa because their end destination if it is south africa why should they go via somalia kenya tanzania and then go down they could go straight from here but will involve uh, a very large distance over the uh, indian ocean okay which is going to be detrimental for them it's a huge huge risk factor having said this there are quite a few sightings of these birds in in uh, in these uh, oceanic islands uh, seychelles and uh, there is a british indian ocean territory in the indian ocean a small speck and there have been quite a few sightings there i personally think all of these birds have got drifted off in those winds because of the way and there could be vagrants you know sometimes they just fly off in a particular direction and then get carried away in the winds or they could be inexperienced birds so if you have to uh, if i have to explain to you logically why they are just crossing from here from mumbai straight across into mumbai it's because 
that oceanic crossing there is about 2,500 kilometers. Anywhere further lower, much, much longer. And on the return migration, they don't cross the, okay, so they are not returning or they're not flying over the Himalayas or the Tibetan plateau. If this is a dry zone and the winds are quite unpredictable and uh, they are again on the return migration after coming into the north, not making a non-stop flight. So the non-stop flights are only between the northeast to Somalia and then back. Now, after they leave Nagaland or the Northeast, they again gradually move. So they forage all through all through their route to Mua. And these birds prefer to forage in, or they find their food, they, they find their food in these areas and not in this very high elevation Tibetan plateau. It's about 5,000 meters and it's, it's not something. And please also understand that when they move, when they arrive in, uh, their eastern step, which is in the month of June, the first week of June, that is when the summer is also setting in. So before that, it is still cold up there here in the Tibetan Plateau. And as a result, these birds are avoiding this. Okay. Thank you, sir. I hope uh, that answers uh, Majib's question. And next question is by Dr. H.S. Pabla. Uh, sir asks, are there any mass hunting sites anywhere else on there? migratory routes so uh, in 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 africa or in any other places in uh, along their migration route yeah any other places along the okay so uh, sir we are really not aware of that uh, somalia is where they gather in such large numbers and once they leave somalia then they are scattered then they are they are, they are you don't see them in such large numbers even in Southern Africa, in the Rus sites, we don't have any sites like what you see in Lagaland. So they're all scattered. The largest population in, in a Rus site in South Africa will be 25,000. And there is no uh, killing of this bird uh, reported from any, any of these places. What I suspect could may happen is in Southeast Asia, or when they are heading via Vietnam and China, and some of those places where they stop over, but we don't have any information. We really don't have any information. Okay. Right. So, uh, so the next question is by uh, JVD Murthy, sir. And the question is, how many Amur Falcons are still alive today? Oh, uh, Srikant, uh, I missed out the word. The tagged Amurs. Of the ones with oh, the okay. tag. Of these, how tagged. many are still alive today? There are many questions. It doesn't... Hello? Of the, yeah, of the ones that have been tagged, how many are still alive today? How many are still on record? Of okay, so that so there are right now uh, which are still active. One more bird which has been giving us been quite erratic in its response. All of a sudden, it starts trying. Off. There is some technical issues with. So I can say as of now there are four, and okay. thankfully uh, the birds that have been tagged from Manipur. Uh, did make the return migration from uh, Africa and they are now in the breeding grounds. And uh, I'm really, really betting my hopes that uh, those those birds come back to Manipur and that will really, really be a, be a big achievement for the program and for the people there. Lovely. So right now, Lovely. there are four. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. So another question by Vasant Rajan. Any monitoring station established at Somalia or South Africa? Ah, uh, very interesting question. <laughs> no need. No one will have... go to Somalia. Have <laughs> <laughs> to go to Somalia. Have to go to Somalia. I'll just sail off, you know, and meet up with the Somalian pirates and uh, land up there. In, uh, so I had tried to make, uh, on a personal note, I tried to make contacts with bird watchers in Somalia. Maybe some of you who uh, who are in the bird watching bird watchers network can actually help me get me Somalian bird watchers. There are a few people. Suresh. People going watching birds, so uh, and Suresh. monitoring stations. But there are long-term ringing sites in South Africa. So even before these uh, tracking programs were started, uh, in South Africa, there's one uh, lady and her team particularly. She's been uh, ringing Amors for uh, a long, long time—25, 30 years, I think. 
She's been bringing birds regularly and she has been successful in getting a few recaptures. And uh, a few of the birds were actually, uh, the ringed birds were actually killed into, actually caught in 2012. So a lot of uh, the hunters in, in the Pankti village did inform me about having those rings with them. So yes, that is the only monitoring that I uh, that I'm aware of. Okay. Other than in Northeast now that we are monitoring them. Uh, BC, sir, you had you wanted to say something? No, no. I was telling about Somalia. I think in 1990, I almost got killed in Somalia. I was doing a crocodile survey in Somalia, and uh, <laughs> I knew the Somalian Ecological Society who were doing a lot of bird watching. They actually took me to see the Goliath uh, heron and uh, some other birds and I went around with them to see. But uh, Somalia, if you, are, if you say this is my only life, then you can go to Somalia. And uh, no one is going to take the risk of going to Somalia and start a monitoring program. At least current, current situation, pirate in the sea is one part of it, but in the land, the kind of problems, kind of, you know, uh, different uh, tribes, you know, into different groups, you know, there is, uh, you never know when you will be wiped out. Ah, true, true. So, thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing that experience, and we are glad you're you're back safe and sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. So, uh, so the next question is uh, by Murtaza. When do we see Amors in Gujarat? Okay. So the best time to see Amors in Gujarat is uh, uh, April. The last week of April, and okay. ideally along the Porbandar coastline. And uh, I think uh, that there have been a few people who have gone excitedly looking for Amors, thinking that they may actually spot them. And in fact, they did spot them. So I think the last week of April uh, will, and last week of April all the way till uh, middle of May is the time when they pass through. It's not just one specific day. Yeah. Yes. So next year. Last week of April next year, I think, guys, this year, unfortunately, due to lockdown. <coughs> Uh, you would have missed that, but yes. next year, please keep a lookout for that. Uh, yes. So the next question again is by uh, JVD sir, and the question is, could you please tell us about the satellite tagging of Jacobin's cuckoo? That is the first part of the question, yes. Okay, so the, yeah, the, the pied cuckoo has been a dream bird for me, actually. It, it, it was one of those birds that I, I dreamed about tagging even before the Amurs happened, you know. The Amurs happened all of a sudden. So the the pied cuckoo has been in, has been a bird uh, on in one of my target list since maybe 2000, and uh, thankfully now with the technology available, the tank that we have deployed on the pied cuckoo is just two grams. The Amurs are carrying a tank which is five grams. So I may may have forgotten to mention this: any instrument, you know, anything that you deploy on a wild species. Uh, there is a thumb rule. If it is a bird, the thumb rule is that it has to be less than 3% of their body weight. Oh, I see. Or you, Amur may not be able to the Arabian Sea, you may not diving down into the Arabian Sea. So, uh, the weight is one of the challenge. And so, the tank, that 5 gram transmitter that we've been very successful uh, on the Amurs, we couldn't use that for the pied cuckoo because the pied nearly half the weight of the Amors. They just weigh about 70 grams. So anything less than 3% of their body weight should be about 2.5 grams or you know, uh, close to that. And uh, thankfully in 2017, the same company who uh, manufacture these five gram tags, the microwave telemetry from the United States, have uh, started making this two gram transmitter uh, uh, available, uh, you know, and so, yeah, so this, this particular project happened. And uh, as you all know, the pied cuckoo is a summer breeding visitor to India. Another trans-equatorial migrant coming all the way from Africa, coming to the Himalayan foothills, and then going back. And this is the monsoon bird. And this bird tells you the story of the southwest monsoon. This bird flies with the southwest monsoon, while the Amurs fly with the northeast monsoon. So they, in a way, complement each other. While one is a passage migrant, the other is a, a breeding visitor, summer breeding visitor. So we do have a lot of summer breeding visitors at this point of time in Dehradun. Okay. So 
last year, uh, if, if I may just share this with you a little bit, uh, we had conceived this project about two years ago, and uh, luckily we got the money. This is actually a collaborative effort with the Indian Institute for Remote Sensing and uh, funded by the Department of Biotechnology. And uh, they were keen in uh, you know, tracking and uh, uh, getting data which they can relate with uh, uh, the monsoon. So I had uh, told them that this is a fantastic subject. So we got the money, we placed the orders for the transmitters early February 2019 for the transmitters. And uh, unfortunately, the transmitters got delayed and arrived only by end of July. Post July, we could not catch the pied cuckoo. And it was something new to me and I, I was trying to still figure these birds out. It's not going to be easy to catch them. Couldn't catch them. And their cuckoos left. So we had to just sit with these transmitters, sit with our project fund with a researcher, waiting for one entire year for the cuckoos to arrive again. And unfortunately this year, the lockdown critically restricted our movements, you know, so we just cannot go like the way we could have, employ more people to help us catch the cuckoos. But thankfully, there were a few cuckoo pairs that were being monitored just outside of the Wildlife Institute campus. So we're really lucky to capture two birds that project and uh, tag them. So we have named them uh, one, the first bird we have named it Meg, Meg Tooth and Meg Cloud uh, is, the, is the meaning. And the other bird we have named it after the local name, which is Chatak. So we are quite excited, hoping that uh, Meg and Chatak uh, give us some insights into their migration. Uh, do they follow, do they go via Gujarat or do they go in a different direction? Do they, they definitely, I, I, I believe they make these nonstop migrations. I have seen pied cuckoos in Gujarat during my field trips there. And, I, and I'm strongly believe that they are making these. What is very interesting to share here is that the cuckoos and there are many other summer migrants coming into Gujarat. Gujarat is another major gateway. You have blue cheek beaters, European rollers, large numbers, large populations of these birds coming into Gujarat, especially the Kutch landscape. A lot of bird watchers go looking for them. They spend about a I would say roughly a month. They arrive by October and spend one month there. So like the Amur spending time in the Northeast, these birds are spending time here. But I have a feeling that they don't leave till the time the Amur stick, uh, start on their migration. In the sense that they are again waiting for that returning Northeast monsoon winds to hop on and just sail across or glide across and see to Somalia, to the Great Horn of Africa. So Gujarat is our western gateway, and uh, Nagaland and Manipur is our eastern gateway. So it's very interesting. I'm really hopeful that our cuckoos will give us data. Please pray that these birds stay alive, and the transmitters should work. The biggest challenge is that the transmitters should work. Of course. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely interesting fact. Because, uh, yes, uh, we've seen them uh, I mean, uh, loud. Uh, so may I, may I, may I uh, put in something very quickly, please? Yes, yes. Uh, so the Amours can also be called something like uh, a monsoon birds, like the uh, Jacobin's cuckoo or the pied cuckoo is. Or is there a correlation be between the two uh, within a certain period of time after the sighting of the Amours, uh, the pied cuckoo would come in? So the cuckoos are definitely arriving only by the first week of, uh, I mean, or by the last week of May and June, that is the time. So they may be also uh, returning, returning and uh, riding those winds, but they are a little late. They are definitely not, or you're right, or, or we don't know. So if I'm just looking at it from uh, Deradun and I'm expecting the cuckoos to arrive in the first week of June, Maybe they have already arrived in India, that is in Gujarat, and then you know spending time in Gujarat and then moving slowly up to uh, uh, Dehradun or what is Indian plains. You don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. is, that's a possibility. That could happen. So there could be a correlation, a periodicity, or a regularity of the first arrival of the Amur yes. end of April, yes. and then maybe. Oh, it's a hypothesis. Yes. 
Yes, it's a hypothesis. Yes, it's only a hypothesis. Yes, hypothesis. You need to yes, yes, it, you know, yes. Yes, be easy. Don't come to a conclusion. No, no, I'm not coming to a conclusion, but there could be. It, it's a possibility. It's it has a, not been looked into. It's a hypothesis, yes. so it needs testing. Right. Thank you, BC. Thank you. So, uh, just in addition to that, I mean, uh, there is also a working theory, or I could say, a uh, talk about Jacobin's cuckoo or the pied cuckoo be uh, a population of which is resident in the country. Yes, yes. So, yes, yes. Uh, how how do we differentiate these? Okay. So that's very interesting, actually. See this. I mean, this is not uh, specific to the cuckoos. Are we there changing are, the subject are... from Amur Falcon to Jacobian Kaku? <laughs> <laughs> not so, totally, no, sir. So okay. Let's, let's stick to let's stick to Amur Falcon. I think let's not right. divert our topic to something else. Yes. Uh, sorry, BC. Sorry, BC. My fault. Sorry. Yes, you can please take the questions on Amur Falcon. Murti, Murti, you should be put on a leash. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am sorry, BC. So you can't please uh, yeah. go, go to the questions, please. I will. I will continue here. Uh, so uh, there are two questions. Uh, one by uh, Mr. Prem Thomas and another by uh, Nandikumar sir. The question is how high do they fly? I think that's, that's already answered. answered. The Amul Falcons. Amul that's been answered. Yeah, that's been answered. So since that they have been answered, so uh, Uncle, I think you've got your answer there. Next question is by Bhumi Nathan. While returning to South Africa, do they move as mass numbers? In South Africa? Yes. While returning to South Africa, yes. In South Africa. In South Africa, they 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 don't move in mass numbers, but it, it, it's simply because they do show wintering uh, site fidelity. Okay, the site fidelity thing is very important in the sense that they go to their respective foraging grounds. So we are looking at uh, Southern Africa as their non-breeding or their foraging grounds or the wintering grounds. So uh, some of the birds go and forage in, in, uh, in Botswana, in the Kalahari region, while the others are roosting in uh, agricultural landscape in, in South Africa, close to Johannesburg or close to Pretoria. So there are different roost sites. So they are having to funnel into Nagaland in mass, primarily because of those winds that they wait out for, okay? And then once they are in Somalia, then again, they're they are on their own going and foraging in their uh, foraging grounds. And when it is time for them to depart, they again convert. So you don't see them in, in mass numbers. Okay. There mm -hmm. could be another factor that is governing here, the availability of food the kind of concentration of food that is available in Northeast or in Nagaland and Manipur, that kind of concentration is in other parts of their, uh, whether it's the breeding grounds or in the wintering grounds. So it is basically dictated by termites. The shear, if you're talking about Amur Falcon, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the congregation as the spectacle, then you should actually look at the termite emergence super spectacle. So it's just millions and millions of uh, termites that are just coming out of the ground every day for that three to four weeks. That uh, So it is it is being dictated by food. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, so again, I have to say there are so many messages here appreciating the talk and everyone, uh, it was indeed a great pleasure for everybody to hear this talk. So there's so much of appreciation in the messages for, me, for us. So the next question is uh, by Prati Chitnis. The question is, could you share the website where we can track the bird migration? Okay, so uh, you can actually look up in this uh, URL, which is very simple, satellite tracking.eu. So this is actually uh, some of my Hungarian collaborators who host their birds on it and uh, they have they are hosting some of these birds up there it's called satellite tracking.eu satellite tracking written together.eu and all that you need to do is they are in different languages or scripts so choose the english language and then there is a section called birds there is a you know a, a, a series of tabs and the choose the tab birds and once you click on that then you will get a database of all of those birds that are currently being tracked or in the past that were tracked in that database. So in the database, if you go and choose the tab country or the region, then India, you can select. If you select India, then all of the uh, 
uh, amours that were that have been tagged and tracked they are listed there so choose one of the words and go and say choose the tabs and and it will show you the map and show you the current location uh thank you sir and also i pasted the uh, url on the chat chat so you guys i mean anyone interested can please look it up yes 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 so um the next question again so is uh what yeah. dr sukumar dr samuel sukumar your look uh, yeah suresh your involvement of the local community is the then no, no, what is the weight loss sikan i'm sorry he says what is the weight loss of the, of a bird no after that it is okay it's much ahead after that okay yeah a little further down he says what yeah. is the weight loss of the what bird what is if you are asking about what is what is the weight loss of the bird if that is the question yes during right. the oceanic crossing okay so so when the amours are arriving in in nagaland at that time they are in poor body mass the thing is you have to remember that they have just finished breeding and they have uh, made a 5000 Kilometer flight to Nagaland, and uh, here in Nagaland, the muscle mass, especially on the on the breast muscles, are you know very poor. So it is here in Nagaland that they fatten up. So they put on weight here in Nagaland. And how I know this? If you talk to the local hunters who have been hunting them, they don't prefer to eat the birds when they are when they have just arrived. They wait for the bird to fatten up. That's what they say. so only towards the time of departure they would like to eat this bird so they are gaining the weight here so they could lose easily lose 20 grams weight if it's a 150 50 gram bird it can easily lose 20 grams okay so this is a general crossing especially right uh, is this during the oceanic crossing that now can they where are they where are they going to weigh them <laughs> uh, it's simple i think you know one need to know you know where this is only caught here you know they are not being caught elsewhere you know to weigh them and to see how much of weight loss they have taken that is true that is true sir so uh, just moving on to the next question it's by sagarika melkote i have a doubt uh, the aerial of the transmitter i think he means the tra Uh, the aerial of the transmitter seems to be long and like couple of wires sticking out behind antenna. the bird. yeah the antenna aspect. yes so there is there is an antenna that has to that has to uh, i mean that is designed to stick out stick out of the bird and uh, it is not something like you know uh, it it is quite flexible and uh, that is what actually helps uh, transmit the signals and the satellites to pick up without that antenna they wouldn't even signal yes so the uh, next part of the question is is there any danger that these wires could get caught in a tree or worse in an electric cable uh, no. no 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 there no. is there is no such a case uh, it, it it just cannot get caught because this even though it is quite uh, flexible enough it would just not uh, you know coil up or something like that it's quite straight and stiff no okay. so it the is in line with the posture of the So is the number of the number of birds you have tagged you know, and the results you know itself shows there is not even one case you know what? where you have lost. You are right. That itself sir. is the answer. Yes, you are right. You are yes, right. Yes, you are right. You are right. So uh, the next question: Why didn't they cross the Western Ghat for straight Africa? Because, that's Africa? been answered. That's been answered, been answered already. No, I'm just telling okay. the uh, the person who asked this question that it has been Mujib. answered. Mujib. Mujib. uh the bird is not crossing himalayas yes uh, satyan even that was answered so uh yeah avinandan has a question has the awareness about amur falcon spilled over to other avifauna especially the endemics and other unique bird species of nagaland and manipur if not is there an opportunity to do so yeah so yes uh, that's that's an interesting question again so the awareness levels are definitely very high and uh, people have started uh, in fact at least in yongyam chen this particular village i can tell you that the general feeling amongst the council members about the um, i mean among the villagers is that 
they want to set aside this particular community land or community forest and they don't want it to be named as uh, you know amur falcon conservation area they don't want it to be named they feel that the bird is here only i mean 3 weeks 3 to 4 weeks maximum in a year but there is a lot more diversity in this place and so we would like it to be called biodiversity conservation area okay and okay. last year nagaland government uh, you know listed more than 90 community reserves uh, as part of the community reserve network in the country so nagaland now has about 120 community reserves so which is uh, a recognition from the government and uh, as a result maybe in, uh, slowly there will be some funds allocated for each of these areas and this effort is being taken by local people the local people have come forward and said that uh, have actually proposed to the government that we want this land to be declared as a community reserve it's a proposal from the people all of these things indicates that at least they are able to protect the habitat there is still a more some amount i mean there is still hunting there is still hunting for a lot of small birds and a lot of uh, other things and uh, so but at least the first step in protecting those forest small patches of forest and gradually gradually you know create awareness and uh, protect everything else it's happening it's really happening okay not only in uh, manipur not only in nagaland but also in uh, in manipur okay, okay. Uh, shall we close the questions now there's one last question coming up bc one last question sir one last question what makes doyang reservoir such a high dense roosting site why why doyang has such a high uh, density of roosting site density of roosting site ha huh. well i i really i really don't know but there are also other sites where equally such high density amur falcons are there but there are no roost sites okay so it so happened that the reservoir that you see in doyang or the doyang reservoir actually came up only in 2000 or 2004 the entire submergence took place only in 2004 so the amurs used to roost underwater so you go and talk to locals the the local people they'll say ye chiriya to pehle pani ke andar roost karta tha before it is submerged but down the slopes down there all of that area has now become submerged and the amurs have been pushed uh, to the higher slopes and now we see a large number there is one more site in the meghalaya uh, assam uh, border the silchar region of assam which is known as omrang sau there is a reservoir there there again the amurs are roosting in very large numbers so there seems to be a connect with water and not necessarily i mean a presence of the reservoir is an additional thing but water is definitely there so they will roost along the river side and on those slopes in facing in a particular uh, direction you know the aspect is probably playing a role here and uh, so we are, we are still trying to understand that so i i feel that it is not just presence of reservoir but it is more to do with water okay okay thank you uh, and i think we are done with the questions uh, jvri uncle I think, I think we should think, close now. I think so. It's quite late now, so I think we'll have to close. Yes. So uh, uh, I would like to offer my thanks to Suresha. Wonderful talk. Absolutely brilliant. So and thank I'm you, so uh, Murthy sir. And I would like to just pass my last uh, few statement. Last yes. statement I would like to make here is that uh, please uh, uh, go and tell these stories. We need good stories to be passed around. now often we are talking about uh, you know first bad stories bad situations but please pass on these good stories yep. and word of mouth the story about amur falcon conservation can actually bring in conservation in those areas i so, don't know whether whether the story that i pass on or we pass on will be as colorful and interesting as the story you just told us what we will be doing on that thank you so much thank you very much sir really interesting thank you very much Thank you. And Thank you very my much. My special thanks to BC as well. Thanks a lot. And this is what old friendship means. He said, "Why don't you have this on Amur Falcons?" And he helped set up the talk. So my special thanks go to BC as well. Thanks a lot, BC. Thank you. I only give you good speakers. 
I always give you good speakers, man. <laughs> yes, sir. Know, yes, sir. I know that. We acknowledge that. And all said and done. Thanks yeah. are in order. Even if you don't want them, I will still thank you on. Okay, okay. I will take it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you, Dr. Suresh. Uh, I, Suresh, I'd like I, I to have you to, back some I other time. Especially thank Suresh. Suresh. Maybe thank next time you. we'll speak on the, uh, we'll have something on the uh, pipe uh, cuckoo. Yeah. All yours, Very sir. Suresh. All yours. I'm available. Suresh. Yes, sir. Suresh. I need to thank you. <laughs> no problem, sir. Please don't thank me. It was a fantastic <laughs> Thank you, Suresh. So many That's a wonderful, wonderful presentation from your side. <laughs> it's really very nice to see. I have not been to be in Nagaland, but I always be interacting with you. When are you going? When are you going? But it's a lovely presentation. I, I always <laughs> tell her, if you have not seen a Amur, see Suresh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank madam. You. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Srikant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. For yeah. this. Thank you so much. And I think people can write to me if they still have questions. And uh, yeah. So, sure. so, yeah, we, will, great, we, will great. Be, we will pass on your email address, sir. And maybe they can uh, uh, reach out for any other questions. Yes. Uh, but yes. thank you so much, uh, sir. The story of long leg, uh, I'm correct, will I'm always be there in our minds. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suresh. Yeah, it was a great night. Good night. Thank you, Aminan. Hello, Aminan. Yeah, hi, hi. Long time. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for most of our other listeners, uh, next week we have a talk on uh, mangroves, and uh, it has been given by uh, Tej Munkar Saab. So please, please join us again next Sunday. It will be a wonderful presentation like today. And 26th, 26th July happens to be the International Mangrove Day. Yes, that's right. That's, that's right. right. So, uh, as a commemorating for that day, we are uh, we have arranged this talk, and it would be a wonderful talk. Please do join us again, and inform your friends as well. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner. Sir, or you. Thank yeah. you, sir, Dr. Sri. This is Surbi says hi to Nandini. Babi ko bolna. Nalini, not Nandini. Nalini. Sorry, Nalini would. Uh, my I, will, I will tell. I will tell her. Right, done. All of you change her name to Nandini. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Right. Right, Amin. See you. Okay. See you. See you. Great. Yeah, it was the best so far. Like you know, amazing uh, this thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Great. so much. Okay. Yeah. And also, I think GK joined today. Uh, Umesh. Yeah, GK was there. Yes. GK was there, yes. Um, yeah. Okay, see you all. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye bye.